But I just wanted to acknowledge that History Cafe is a monthly program, and it's a collaboration between MOHAI, the Seattle Public Library, and History Link. And tonight, we acknowledge uh, the Seattle Public Library as the main collaborator. Thank you very much. Um, if I could just say a little bit about the Wing Luke Asian Museum. Uh, it is 47 years old, a 47-year-old uh, community-based museum, the only pan-Asian museum in the country telling the Asian American immigrant story. It's the first Smithsonian affiliate in the Pacific North, Northwest. And uh, I just want to say it's been a great privilege for me to serve on the board for nearly 20 years. Um, I've always been inspired by the vision of the museum, and the vision, of course, is very close to the vision of Wing Luke himself, for whom the museum uh, is a legacy. Uh, and that vision, of course, and you're going to hear much more about it from our wonderful speakers, is for a more equitable and open society. And I have to say, it, that is the filter. Wing Luke's vision is the filter that the staff and board work from every day. Um, but we will hear more about the, his vision from our speakers. So to begin, we have an amazing thing here, three uh, Seattle natives. <laughs> and I myself am a Seattle native, so we have four Seattle natives up here today, which <laughs> I think in itself is somewhat historical. So um, our first speaker, uh, well, I'll go through all three of them first, as I said, is uh, our esteemed Attorney General, Bob Ferguson. Um, Bob has been the AG since 2013, and many of you are good Seattle folks, so you'll remember his uh, history. Seattle, uh, Seattle, King County, excuse me, County Council member from 2003 to 2012. Uh, and he will address uh, Wing Luke as a champion of civil rights during his political and legal career. And Bob is a proud graduate of Blanchett High School. We then go on to, we'll go on to Ron Chu, and Ron will focus on Wing Luke's impact on the Chinese American community when he was elected to the Seattle City Council, as well as his impact on Ron himself. Um, Ron also a Seattle native, currently owns and operates Chu Communications, a community history and resource development consulting firm. He's recognized for his innovative work documenting local community history through multimedia and oral history projects. Um, I was very fortunate to get to know and be dear friends with Ron as, when he served as executive director of the Wing Luke Museum from 1991 to 2007. And prior to that, he was editor of the International Examiner for 13 years and currently serves as president of that newspaper's board of direct directors. And in his work life, he serves as director of the International Community Health Services Foundation. And Betty, Betty Luke, Betty Luke has a very unique role as the little sister of Wing Luke. And we, it is an amazing legacy and we are blessed to have her here just to share uh, her family memories with us. Betty is a community activist, uh, multi-education trainer for many years, uh, has been very, very active in leadership roles in a variety of Chinese American community organizations. So we are lucky to have these three great speakers and we'll begin with Bob. First, thanks all of you for being here and this, this really great turnout to uh, chat about a man I, I admire greatly. It's an honor to be both with uh, Betty and Ron uh, who, who can share from a real personal, personal perspective uh, about Wing Luke. Um, I never knew him, um, but uh, uh, I have spent a lot of time uh, thinking about him and reading about him and I'm looking forward to sharing uh, what we've learned in the office of the Attorney General about Wing Luke. Uh, when I became Attorney General in 2013, I had known of Wing Luke, of course, knew him as being a Seattle City Council member and his prominent role there, his trailblazing uh, a career, uh, but I really hadn't realized until that time that he actually worked as an Assistant Attorney General in the office of the Attorney General for close to uh, five years before he ran for the Seattle City Council and uh, uh, had become very interested in his career as an attorney uh, before he ran for Seattle City Council in the part of his career that is, of course, especially well known. So I've been uh, interested in spending some time learning about that career, which I think is fascinating as it relates to Wing Luke, but also to the civil rights history in Washington State. Um, and, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we move forward. So let's get started. I have a few slides. Whoops, hopefully I'm doing that right. There we go. So there is Wing Luke, and uh, bonus points for anyone who identified the gentleman on uh, your left. Anybody know the gentleman on your left? 
going once. I think I heard a name. Thank you, John O'Connell, Attorney General. It's a quiz here. It's a pop quiz, folks. You've got to be sharp. You've got to be sharp. But it's uh, John O'Connell, who was Attorney General for the state of Washington from 1956 to 1968. Uh, that picture, I believe, is taken in 1962 as Wing Luke is taking a leave of absence from his work as an Assistant Attorney General to run for the Seattle City Council. Uh, and he's receiving an award as he's leaving the office uh, at that time. We'll come back to his time in the AG's office shortly. So here's what you might already know. Uh, Wing Luke was a natural and charismatic leader. Uh, I've talked to a number of folks, including his campaign manager, Ken Pritchard. You'll see Ken up here uh, on the slide shortly. Uh, they all agree from an early age he was, a, he was a leader, a natural leader, and took on leadership roles throughout his life, starting with, in the photograph here, being student body president at Roosevelt High School right here in Seattle. He went on to the University of Washington where he was sophomore class president. Here, apparently, he, uh, the picture is him urging fellow Roosevelt students to fight against Halloween vandalism. A still topical issue, perhaps. I don't, I don't, I don't perhaps. I'd mentioned Ken Pritchard, so that is the gentleman with Wing Luke, is Ken Pritchard. Ken, who is still very much alive, I had the great opportunity to interview him recently. That interview is available online, I think through the Wing Luke Museum, about his role with Wing Luke in that first campaign for the Seattle City Council. And as I think you know, in 1962, Wing Luke became the first Asian American elected to public office in the Pacific Northwest when he was elected to the Seattle City Council. The basics are he served from 62 to 65, and this is the role for which he is most remembered. One aspect I'll mention briefly, I'll be focused on his civil rights legacy, but one aspect of his leadership on the City Council, which I at least want to mention, that I think is relatively unknown, unless you are deep into Wing Luke's history, is his... Uh, deep involvement on saving the Pike Place market. Um, he launched a crusade to save the Pike Place market from private real estate development. Uh, he called for the formation of a civic development corporation group to revitalize the market. And one journalist at that time, in the early 60s, wrote, in the city's blind, foolish rush to eliminate one of its irreplaceable treasures, the Pike Place market, at least one official voice is not afraid to defy the tide. He is Councilman Wing Luke. So other folks are often mentioned around the Pike Place market, and rightly so. But for whatever reason, I sometimes feel Wing Luke does not, as the decades have gone by, get quite the recognition which was understood at that time that he played a very key role uh, in, them, in saving the Pike Place market. Now this next slide has a sound uh, icon, I believe. We're going to see if we're going to make this work. Okay, so when he was on the Seattle City Council, uh, he was very involved in civil rights issues. He established uh, the Municipal Human Rights Commission. He helped draft the city's uh, 1963 open housing legislation. Um, and keep in mind, this is back in 1963, believe it or not, it was lawful for someone to refuse to sell a home, for example, uh, to someone based on their race. And I'll be returning to this based on his time in the office of the Attorney General. So when Wing Luke joined the Seattle City Council, he was intensely focused on trying to correct this, and he proposed uh, this ordinance. Um, although he helped to draft the ordinance, he actually ended up voting against it to protest the uh, removal of an emergency clause that, uh, that would have put the ordinance into immediate effect. What council members wanted to do was put it to a public vote. He said, no, let's just vote on it. It's the right thing to do. Let's make it lawful. What some council members who oppose it said, let's have the voters vote on it. Uh, the voters eventually uh, defeated it. In other words, allowed the discrimination to continue by a two-to-one margin, believe it or not, in March of 1964. Um, so his battle was not initially successful, um, although that was uh, a still a, a fight that continued. What we have here is a clip. Uh, are you for that provision which prohibits discrimination because of race? You have No, said... I'm, I'm not in favor of that on another basis, on the basis that it violates the Eighth Commandment of the Decalogue, thou shalt not steal. This is an unjust usurpation of property rights. You are against that portion. Uh, you are, of course, a minister, and I don't have it available, but what chapter and verse is it in the Bible, in the New Testament, love thy neighbors thyself? Um, <coughs> I don't know the exact verse right offhand. Thank you. This is a photograph of uh, Wing Luke with a couple of folks, uh, Father Lemieux, president of Seattle University, and a, a Mrs. Frank Little, uh, uh, doing some community activism. So Wing Luke obviously uh, made a significant mark on the city of Seattle in his role as a uh, city council member, but I do want to talk a little bit about his role as an assistant attorney general. His role as an assistant attorney general was his first public service role. 
Um, and he came to the Office Attorney General after a couple of years. He graduated from the University of Washington Law School and then spent a couple of years at a private law practice of Malcolm McLeod, McLeod where he defended Nisqually and Puyallup fishing rights. Uh, he's quoted as saying he sometimes received his payments in fish uh, from, his, uh, from his clients. He came to the Office of the Attorney General um, at an auspicious and I believe not coincidental historic moment. In March of 1957, Governor Al Roslini signed an important Civil Rights Act. It was a far-reaching piece of uh, anti-discrimination legislation here in the state of Washington. Wing Luke was hired in May of 1957 and was appointed Chief Legal Counsel for the Washington State Board Against Discrimination. It's now our Human Rights Commission, but then it was called the Board Against Discrimination. So he was the state's lawyer on behalf of that, uh, on behalf of that board. And he immediately assumed a leadership role in testing and enforcing this brand new civil rights statute that we had on a statewide basis uh, years before we had comparable federal legislation. So by the way, I should just mention on this last picture, this is him at a meeting of the Board Against Discrimination. We just found this picture deep in the archives down, uh, down in Olympia. Uh, there's a group of photos, not high quality, but that's an actual meeting of the Board Against Discrimination in which uh, Wing Luke is, uh, is working. The Board Against Discrimination was created in 1949, and uh, um, he uh, immediately went to work on testing uh, some aspects of that law. I'll give you two brief examples. One of the first cases was a case called Fox and Moss versus the Alibi Tavern in Tacoma. This is 1958. Fox and Moss were two uh, Tacoma NAACP leaders, and they wanted to test the public accommodation section of that law against discrimination. A bartender refused to serve them, and so they brought a complaint against the board against, uh, to the board against discrimination. It led to the first public hearing ever held by the board and the first state's civil rights cease and desist order issued west of the Mississippi. I just discovered this recently. Wing Luke was the lead attorney on that case along with one other attorney. I've gone back to look at the transcripts. The transcripts are all available. They're down there in the archives. And Wing Luke is the lead attorney. There's two attorneys on it, but he is the lead attorney on that case. So he successfully uh, represented the board against discrimination on cases like that. Another slightly more well-known case and very important case is O'Meara versus Washington State Board Against Discrimination. This is the case that really helped spur uh, the statewide movement for open housing. In 1959, an African-American couple, Robert L. Jones, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Robert Jones, tried to buy a home in an all-white neighborhood. The O'Meara family refused to sell it to them, uh, and the Joneses complained to the Board Against Discrimination. Wing Luke handled that case as well, part of a legal team, but he was uh, the key person uh, early on in that case. The board found, under Wing Luke's legal arguments, that the O'Meara's discriminated against the Jones because of race, unfair practice under our state law. The O'Meara's challenged that, went to King County Superior Court, where the, where the O'Meara's prevailed. Judge Hodson, King County Superior Court, wrote, a private individual acting in his private capacity is perfectly free to discriminate as he pleases. That's a direct quote. It was appealed to the state Supreme Court. At that point, Attorney General O'Connell handled it, although Wing Luke and another attorney were involved, obviously, in the briefing. I've seen his notes around that as well. It came down to a 5-4 decision before our state Supreme Court in 1961, in which the Supreme Court upheld the judge's decision, saying it was lawful to discriminate in the context of housing. And the US Supreme Court refused to hear that case. That is the background that is frankly little well known in how that uh, open housing movement got started at the Seattle City Council and the backdrop legally that led to that fight at the city level and at the state level as well. Wing Luke was in the middle of it. He was leading it in a way that frankly I did not fully understand until just in the last six weeks or so, thanks to my sister asking me to speak here tonight, that we got deep into the archives, <laughs> got deep into the archives and really found these transcripts. We're still going through it. There's lots of notes. We're trying to find out which notes are Wing Luke's and the other attorney. Uh, there's an attorney who was involved in the case who's still alive, and uh, I'll be interviewing him in a couple weeks. He, uh, he knew Wing Luke well. Uh, they socialized together. I'm looking forward to hearing more from him because they work together as part of a legal team on these cases and many others. Now I'm nearly done. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides. Betty, you may not be able to see it, but you're in it. You're in it. You know this one. You know this one. So he declared his candidacy for the Seattle City Council in December of 61. Um, he took a leave of absence, as I mentioned, from our office, campaigned full-time for three months. He was targeted by racism and smear campaigns, uh, accusing him of communist sympathies and others, but he prevailed. It was a real grassroots campaign. Um, and uh, uh, this is an election night photo. Um, and our co-panelist, Betty Luke, is holding a sign that hopefully you can read. It says, quote, we knew all along you'd get it. Congratulations. I'll let her talk about that more if she wishes. It must have been a, it must have been a wonderful night. I think this might be my last slide. 
So, Betty, you're in this one as well, along with uh, some of your siblings. And so, to bring this full circle, uh, you know, in the Office of Attorney General, believe it or not, since those cases that Wing Luke was, was bringing, uh, we have not had a civil rights presence in the Office of Attorney General since that time. Uh, if someone called our office in the last 45 years with a civil rights complaint, we would refer them somewhere else. Federal Government, uh, Human Rights Commission. We did not handle those cases, which never seemed quite right to me. Uh, so I've created a civil rights unit and now has four attorneys and a couple of professional staff. And it seemed appropriate to me that while we'd never named a unit or a division in our office after an individual, it seemed appropriate to start a new tradition. And so the civil rights unit that we have is now called the Wing Luke Civil Rights Unit in the Office of Attorney General. There could be no more appropriate person to name it after for reasons I think are evident to all of us now. Um, a final thought, you know, Wing Luke is, uh, you know, he was a tremendous leader. In my few minutes, I could only touch on a particular aspect of his leadership around civil rights, but really he was able to transcend obstacles, overcome prejudice. He had strong moral character and a progressive vision. He was not afraid to adopt an unpopular opinion, that is clear. He went his own way. If he wanted to preserve the pipe place market, he was gonna do it even if his colleagues did not agree. Open housing, he had objections from his colleagues, he went forward anyway. That was his, very much his personality. That was very much his style, uh, someone going back and reading about the work that he did. Last one, I'm wearing a, a Luke button, right? This one's kind of a beat up one. I have no idea if that's a Wing Luke Seattle City Council button, but I have reason to believe it very well might be. I'll spare you the details on that. If anyone knows, I want to know. If you know Wing Luke, I want to talk to you. That's my personal cell number, call me up. <laughs> I'm not joking, uh, so uh, I'm intensely interested in his history. If you know him, if you have photographs of him, I've already talked to Sylvia, who's here, an old friend of mine. I had no idea Sylvia, we hadn't talked about Wing Luke, to know that she knew Wing Luke uh, uh, many years ago, obviously, and has photographs of her with him. So if you have those photographs, please uh, let me know. It's my personal cell number, call me up. Uh, and now you get the, the, the great speakers. Thanks so much for your time. But I thought I would share, um, in terms of Wing Luke's impact, uh, three personal intersection points. Um, and, uh, you know, these are not things I normally talk about, but, um, uh, you know, as you reach a certain age, I had my birthday um, two days ago, you know, you sort of say, well, what the hell, I might as well talk about it, right? <laughs> so, um, three intersection points. Um, one is uh, the hand laundry. Uh, second intersection point uh, is World War II, and the third intersection point it's actually a little bit directly through Betty, which is the museum itself, which again, I'm not gonna talk about in too much detail. Um, let me share a little bit of my personal history as part of a backdrop, and I see some friends here, so the, you know, some of them can probably relate to being the child of Chinese immigrants. Um, so my father came here, um, I'm sorry, my grandfather came here in 1911 as a cannery worker. Uh, leaving uh, China really because of the poverty and warfare. Um, so he lived and worked here, but because of the immigration laws, he couldn't bring my grandmother over. So he went back periodically to China to have kids. When my dad came of age, he came in 1930. Um, because there weren't really any Chinese women here, he went back to China in 1937, married my mother but because of exclusion laws, he couldn't bring her here till 1950. So um, for many of us, there was this, this broken history, which is sort of in one place and another place, and somehow some generation much later tries to figure it all out. Um, so um, my father worked um, in the hand laundries, um, um, all during his early years, he left China when he was 13. He came here and started working. Um, had a series of hand laundries. The last hand laundry was up in the university district. I remember talking about it. He says, oh yeah, it was a couple blocks away from this um, uh, Wing Luke guy. You know, and that's when I realized it was sort of an intersection point. Um, and I actually, my early years, I, I grew up I was very, very little, but I was actually in the university district. And um, um, later, my dad left uh, the hand laundry. It was very hard work, as Betty can probably attest. And um, so he went and did even harder work in the restaurant. Um, but at least it paid better, he said, because you could make tips. And it was more an opportunity to make more money. But 
I remember um, him sharing a lot of that laundry history in the context of the election of Wing Luke in 1962. And I don't think I can share um, or overemphasize how profound a moment it was for the Chinese American community. Both my parents, even though I'm actually first, second, third, fourth generation, they're both immigrants. But to see somebody who's Chinese American in that era to be able to move out of the hand laundries was a powerful moment. And just incredible source of pride. I remember the, the actual newspaper where they clipped it and they saved it and they talked about it. Um, it was an extraordinary moment. So the, the laundries were an intersection point um, for that connection with Wing Luke for me. A second intersection point came about um, a little later when I was doing uh, some research on Chinese American history. Um, and in particular, I started researching my late uncle uh, who was killed in World War II. Uh, he was um, a student at the University of Washington studying electrical engineering. He got drafted near the end of the war. Um, he went overseas, he trained at Fort Lewis, uh, and he was deployed uh, to Italy as part of the 10th Mountain Division. And so um, there were a number of negatives that were sent back to my father, which he stored in the basement, which he had never developed. And so he gave them to me as I was researching, and then I developed the pictures, and lo and behold, I see uh, Wing Luke alongside my uncle, and they're, you know, holding, they're with horses, and they're training, you know, on skis and so forth. Um, uh, Wing made it back. Uh, my uncle didn't. He was um, killed um, uh, attacking a German submachine gun nest. Um, and he was very, very close to my dad. My dad never talked about him. We went every year. Uh, there's a festival called Qingming, where you go and visit the grave sites of those who are relatives who are deceased. But, um, you know, my dad was, again, very moved by him and then talked about Wing because, again, they had a shared history. One came back, one didn't come back. Um, the irony is that at the time my... Um, late uncle was um, fighting for this country, my dad couldn't bring my mother here because of the exclusion laws. So in some ways, um, the connection of Wing is also his service to this country, which paved the way for the acceptance of the Chinese and for my family and ultimately for my mother to come here and reunify in one place because she had been trying for many years without success uh, to rejoin my dad. And it created a great rift in the family because, again, after um, you know, 13 years of separation, you know, there's, a, there's almost a culture um, gap between the two of them. And it wasn't until later, much later, that I actually realized there were other issues that, which related to an older brother who was born in China but who uh, died when he was fairly young um, because my dad had to leave to come back to America just because of immigration issues. And so he wasn't there during that time when my older brother, the one that nobody ever told me about until I started researching, uh, had passed away. Um, so World War II also is a personal intersection point for me um, that I realized much later just through doing research and then finding these photos. Uh, the third intersection point um, actually came about um, when I became director of the Wing Luke Museum. Um, and Betty was the one who approached me about it. And I remember initially our conversation, she had talked about the importance of the work that Wing did and preserving our common history and then trying to move it in a direction that it embraced you know, our common struggles as Asian Americans and Chinese Americans. And um, she talked me into it. Uh, uh, but. But, you know, it really wouldn't have happened without the context of, of what her brother meant to my family and what he meant to our larger community uh, in terms of what he was as both a role model and specifically some of the things that Bob mentioned in terms of the specific things he did. Um, and, and then that allowed me to have an opportunity to really help transform the museum with Betty's support and the support of others in the community. 
Uh, so those are my personal intersection points um, to the Wing Luke story. And with that, I'll let Betty talk more directly because I, I actually never had a chance to meet Wing, but I felt his influence throughout my life. So Betty? My sister Ruby said that my mother picked up our second brother, Robert. He started crying, so she put him down, picked me up. <laughs> That's how I ended up in that picture. <laughs> okay. Um, I was in Washington, D.C. last week, and people were talking about the Wing Look Museum, and a number of people said, are you younger or older than Wing? And I said, well, let me put it this way. Last year, he would have been 90. <laughs> he was number one, and I was number six, and there's 17 years difference. And part of that, as Ron mentioned, the Chinese exclusion laws that did not allow a mother to come over, uh, and Wink came over in 1931. And so over the next 10 years, uh, five more of us uh, were born in Seattle, Washington. The advantage of being the youngest child, I think, I really didn't realize what a great advantage it was, because I had all these role models to learn from and then aspire to want to learn as quickly so I could get to the point where the, the older siblings were. And so it was a, a great exposure. But in terms of Wing's activity, as a, a youngster growing up and watching things, I, perhaps it was because I listened more, but I happened to be fortunate enough to be present during a lot of key landmark things that occurred. And both family-wise and also political and legal-wise. And I, I really value that. And, and I need to do more recording of that because those insights, they're, they're going to be lost. Um, the earlier picture you saw, Wing, he was the uh, um, University Heights uh, graduating class. <laughs> and he told me that when he was there, there were a few other uh, Chinese students got harassed and teased and um, just treated terribly. And he intervened and, and you know, helped fight off the, the hecklers. And one day he said, this sucks. <laughs> doesn't work. And so what he decided to do, and I was so impressed with his strategy. He was an artist. He drew a daily cartoon. He picks selective natural leaders uh, on the playground. And he shared the cartoons with them. And they intervened because they wanted to see the next day's cartoons. <laughs> they didn't want to, these kids bothering Wing. And to me, it was like such ingenious thinking for an 11, 12-year-old kid. So it's kind of a... a, a indication of the, the kind of thinking and the, and the forward-thinking um, uh, concepts that he had. I look at some of the things he did, and it was like he's 10 steps ahead. He really thought things out in a bigger picture. OK. Wing was drafted into the army in his senior year. And he had already made the newspaper in terms of student body president, inter high president. Um, one story that I was so impressed with is that this is a senior in high school. And during the war, women started entering the, the, um, the different businesses and the different efforts, the war efforts. And what happened is that the children, uh, who I call the the tweens, <laughs> they're too old for babysitting, <clears throat> too young to get a job. The tweens were running the streets and creating havoc in the community. And the community at the newspapers blaming the mothers for being bad mothers. 
Wing stood up for the women. He said, these women are doing a very important wartime effort, community effort. They are doing their best. And he called upon the park departments to create programs uh, for, for these students. And based on that, he became one of nine students invited back to the White House for a symposium on uh, juveniles. And so, it, um, again, it was like really, really thinking in terms of a bigger picture. Because who in 1942, 43 would stand up for women? In this picture, uh, it's both a good and a bad uh, 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 situation. He was you know, in the army, fought for the U.S., but when the war started to close down, our laundry was on 1313 Northeast 42nd Street, University District. When the war started closing down, the landlady evicted us by tripling the rent. And so the next oldest English-speaking member of the family wasn't even a teenager, my sister Connie. So he came home on fur furlough to relocate us. And so the picture is when, when he came home. Um, that's me on the left bottom. <laughs> um, the incident of the eviction really plays into his work in the future uh, with, with open housing. This is the Jackson Street Council. I learned of its importance from an African-American professor. He was writing a book, Dr. Quintar Taylor. Uh, he has a website called Black Past. He was writing a book called Forging a New Community, The Blacks in Seattle. And he cited the Jackson Street Council, the only one in the United States, brought together white, Asian, and black community leaders to try to calm the waters, create a sense of friendship, uh, relationships where people are pulling together. And so Quintar said, this is the only one in the country. And Wing was just, just uh, still in, uh, I think, college at that time. I wanted to show this picture because with the GI Bill, a number of uh, uh, contemporaries uh, were able to go to college. These all became phenomenal leaders. They were able to be the first bilingual graduating class of leaders in Seattle. And the top middle is uh, Ruby Chow, and the left, Art Chin, he was a UW regent for a while. Ben Wu, architect, he designed the first uh, museum uh, on the left, uh, Judge Warren Chang. And so all of them just really became phenomenal leaders and started to shift the kind of activities that were done uh, in the Chinese community because they were playing a balancing act between traditional, uh, rules, uh, expectations, and then bringing in uh, the contemporary world. And so all of them grew uh, in terms of their leadership, not just the Chinese community, but the, in Seattle's uh, leadership community. And, uh, ah, this is related to Mohai. Wing had so much imagination he said he was out walking and he saw this uh, floating ship, the Wawona. And the idea that came to mind was to refurbish it and create a floating maritime museum and a place where scout and school troops can bring their sleeping bags and stay overnight and learn about the maritime um, uh, history of Seattle. Uh, unfortunately, uh, after he passed, the leadership 
uh, was not able to maintain it, but the sculpture by your, your uh, elevator that is made from the wood from the Wawona. Nice, nice tie-in. This is the dedication of Thomas Burke Museum, and uh, um, it was just shortly after uh, the World's Fair. And um, just yesterday, they had a groundbreaking for the expansion. <laughs> so lots of great things are going to happen there. This was when they had live television hearing on open housing broadcasts throughout Seattle. And I want to share some inside stories on some of the things that Bob said and a couple things that, that Ron said. To me, a story that Wing shared with me after this hearing, to me it so represents the kind of leadership that Wing was. This chairing, this open housing, people speaking for and against, and um, actually, I just uh, met with a um, person today who cited that same incident of the reverend saying, the Bible says that blacks and whites and that are they're all supposed to be separate. And Wing says, doesn't the Bible also say, love your neighbor? And this person was so uh, impacted by that. He, he had to share that with me today. But anyways, after the hearing, Wing said these uh, two white men came up to the, uh, the table. And they said, um, we know you're for open housing. You know we are against open housing. We want to thank you for not shutting us down. And that's such an example of, even when people did not have the same opinion, did not agree, they still really admired him for the kind of person, the kind of leadership that he had. Okay, just um, the second from the right top. Uh, Lud Kramer and Wing ran at the same time, and at that time, the average age of the people on the council was really high. I don't have the exact figure, but when Lud and Wing <laughs> ran, uh, they referred to them as the junior councilmen. <laughs> they were so young. Um, I want to tell you a couple of inside stories of uh, uh, some of the other things. The, the Pike Place Market. Wing said that most of the city council members were willing to back the mayor's plan to tear down the Pike Place Market. It's old, it's a flower trap, get rid of it. They're going to razz it. And then they're going to build a huge cement street circling the city. That was going to be the big replacement. And Wing knew he did not have the votes. That's why he took it to the public and proposed establishing friends of the Pike Place Market. And the surge of, of, of response, I mean, everyday people, you know, they were saying, we could do that. We could be part of that. And the surge was so strong. They never brought it for a vote to destroy the, the Pike Place Market. Um, I have an open housing story. In terms of establishing the open housing issues, uh, none of the politicians want to directly address it. There were sit-ins, there were uh, different uh, demonstrations, and uh, finally at one city council meeting, uh, it was proposed that they would study it. And so they would <laughs> form a human rights or civil rights committee. And Wings said, oh, I make a motion that in their work that they will come up with a statement on open housing. And a couple of the other councilmen exploded, it's a given. And Wing smiled and says, oh, in that case, I withdraw my motion. See, the 
the uh, smart move is that that's recorded. That is recorded in the minutes, and he can hold them accountable if they didn't go that direction. So um, I would like to share a couple of... Oh, uh, Bob had talked about when Wing uh, worked on Indian fishing rights. And I remember Wing came home with this uh, package wrapped in newspaper. I was in the, the grocery store at that time, probably junior high age. And I said, what is that? He said, well, the tribe can't afford to pay me, but they gave me this great salmon. <laughs> <laughs> he took it next door to cook it. And years later, we turned, uh, ended up being featured in Sunset Magazine doing his salmon recipe. <laughs> Okay, uh, I want to share uh, a story about the black family who could not uh, buy a house in um, the university district. A sidebar on that is when I was in Oregon and I, was, uh, I met Dr. Quintard Taylor at that time, and when he learned I was from Seattle, he started talking about this really important landmark case. And I thought, Oh, my brother was the attorney. And Quintard went, yeah, all right. <laughs> but the reason he didn't know is the cases are filed under the judge's name. So he didn't know. But once he found out that I was telling the truth, he asked me to proofread his book. <laughs> um, the... The case, I think, um, was so important, even though the judge did not rule in favor, it started the ball rolling in the direction of um, laws, attitudes, uh, and the movement. The, the movement was in motion. And I want to go back to cite Wing's work in the open housing. He had like this bigger umbrella picture to do open housing legislation, it wasn't just to get recompense for our family being kicked out of the laundry, but it was like the bigger picture so that the whole community, all cultures, all people, the whole community would benefit by bringing this, this uh, to, to systemic. And that's one thing I remember Wing telling me, systemic change, systemic change, don't just do individual uh, little things. Um, I want to comment on three things that I think set Wing apart from the other leaders. Because over the years, I kept thinking, why hasn't someone else stepped up? Why hasn't someone else you know, had that, that kind of just broad, wide uh, appreciation, respect, uh, and, and the three things I remember most about Wing are wisdom, wit, and vision. See, intelligence is what you learn. Wisdom is what you do with it. And so he was always thinking ahead. I remember one time he said, I have so many ideas. I wish I had a job. I could just sit at a desk and come up with ideas. <laughs> He had great ideas. But the key is the wit. Wit is being so intelligent and so knowing about something that you could say it in a way that even people who didn't agree with you, they had to laugh. It's kind of like a Chinese uh, uh, Will Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> and the vision, the larger picture, um, he, he had a pattern of thinking that over and over I would admire, and over and over I, I would think, I want to learn to think like that. <laughs> One uh, earlier story is that we had a grocery store and we were adding a room on the back, and there was some construction material, and 
a half dozen kids from a nearby high school were outside discussing how they were going to break into the, the grocery store. <laughs> and Wing had just parked his car and he, he heard them talking. So when he came in chuckling into the house, he was just chuckling away. I said, what happened? He said, well, these kids were thinking of breaking into the grocery store. So I picked up a two by four and gave a battle cry. <laughs> and see, the thing is, if he had ordered them like an angry property owner, the kids would have come back another time. But you scare the pants off them, they're not going to come back. <laughs> um, one last story I want to share with you. And this is, uh, let's see, I was nine, in the grocery store, stack of cans on the shelf. And we was at the, the cash register. I couldn't figure out what it is. It's kind of odd behavior. And I saw my father move forward and stop. What happened was that it was a holdup. And I believe he must have said in Chinese to father, he has a gun. But what Wing did was that he got a paper sack. He gathered all the big bills. Then he pretended he was really nervous and dropped it on the floor. Then he pushed it under the counter. <laughs> and he came up with one dollar bills and a handful of pennies that <laughs> threw in. And I thought, wow, I want to learn to think like that. <laughs> and so just over and over, um, I was fortunate to be in key places um, that, that going back to the, the case with the uh, the black family that could not buy, buy the house. I was a senior in high school, and I, Garfield High School, and I would take the bus down to the courthouse and sit in, and it was so fascinating because I, I would sketch people. And so to be able to have actually witnessed that key event, that key piece of history, uh, that's very, very important in terms of uh, open housing. So, uh, Wing was a lot of things to a lot of people. Uh, the museum exists today where every exhibit is seen through the lens of social justice. And for that to last this long, it's a credit to what Wing stood for and what Wing uh, just, just created in terms of respect and admiration, and that that same spirit still exists today. Uh, I am just curious to know if any of you know what his response was to the Japanese incarceration, and um, I, know, I know of the Japanese American population at uh, Broadway and Garfield was quite high. Looking at that University Heights picture, I'm thinking maybe it wasn't quite as high. At Roosevelt, I don't know those statistics, but I am just curious to know if you know about his reaction to that or um, if you have any other information. He, he just really had a lot of foresight in terms of what's equitable, uh, what's fair to the community, what's fair uh, uh, to the subgroups in there. Uh, let me share two quick examples. Um, you probably know uh, Judge Faith in your Ireland. She was a high school kid that would come visit Wing uh, in the office. And one day uh, she said, I have to write an uh, essay, I have to write a two paper. So Wing went to his office, dug out a book, and he says, write it on apartheid. Who ever even heard of apartheid? 1960s, and she was writing with him uh, to uh, uh, talk in Tacoma. He said, oh, what a beautiful sky, the sun. And Wing said, pollution. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like the issues that nobody else brought up. And so going back to your question, Wing in the 60s used the term multicultural before it even really was a term that was used. And it absolutely, totally respected, valued, admired all different cultures um, all his life. The very, very last picture 
of Wing was uh, <laughs> it was kind of a, a talent show <laughs> at, at the uh, sales center, and it was different politicians were entertaining, and he is wearing a kilt and blowing bagpipes. <laughs> <laughs> And one last story on the culture is that the king of Norway came to visit Seattle. He asked a Norwegian classmate to teach him how to sing the national anthem in Norwegian. And he did that after he introduced the king of Norway. <laughs> um, let me share a, a story that isn't necessarily a direct answer to the question, but. Um, I mentioned my late uncle who uh, was killed in World War II. Um, as I was doing research on him, I found his old yearbooks from um, the old Broadway High School and just to try to figure out who his friends were. And it was interesting in that journey in trying to discover this person I never knew, um, I, I realized actually many of his friends were Japanese American. And his friends, among his friends, was a guy named Jim Makutsu, who was, uh, I believe, the motto for uh, John Okada's book, No No Boy, for those who are familiar with it. Um, you know, um, so I, as I sat and reflected about it, I was thinking, well, so here's my uncle who um, fought for this country, died for this country. Uh, very close friends with somebody who refused to fight for this country because of the um, incarceration. So, you know, sometimes we have a sense of history that is not necessarily what it was. So digging a little deeper, like, enables us to see that there are folks who see beyond so the racial barriers, um, regardless of generation. The army was partially segregated. They specifically segregated blacks. Uh, they segregated um, the Japanese 442nd. Um, Chinese were put in general battalions. Uh, but the, the, the issue that they and their family uh, face back home is that how do you tell the good Asian from the bad Asian? You know, they literally at home wore buttons that said China. And it's unfortunate that it created that sense of good Asian, bad Asian. Um, the army, uh, I'll have to look it up, but I read somewhere that percentage-wise, percentage based on uh, the total population of ethnic groups, the Chinese were the highest percentage uh, drafted to fight into the army. And like I said, Wing was drafted before he finished high school. Uh, let me just mention sort of a parallel issue as I was doing my research on my uncle. Um, there was a PBS documentary uh, done on the 87th Mountain Division, Infantry Battalion, excuse me, and then the 10th Mountain Division. And I don't know if any of you saw it, but it was some years back. Somebody videotaped it and gave it to me, and um, my issue really was just um, not realizing that, you know, because I saw these pictures from my uncle, and um, if you believe the documentary, they were all white. I mean, everybody was white, and so, so where, was, where was my uncle? Where's my history? And so that's, I think, the painful process for a lot of us is sort of rediscovering what our history is, because it never really was told. And, and just one thing to add that uh, you mentioned him being a, a visionary leader and uh, a couple things that uh, I would add is that I, I think Betty you mentioned Lud Kramer. There's a photograph of Lud Kramer who's on the city council with Wing Luke. Lud Kramer was later Republican Secretary of State for a number of years in, in Washington State. Uh, Wing Luke was in many respects what we want from our elected officials today, right? He was able to work across the aisle. He and Lud Kramer worked together on many issues. As my understanding is they were close allies in many respects. Um, and he was able to uh, take on extremely challenging issues, right, and be a leader on those in which they were not necessarily popular in his community, open housing being a very good example, and yet he was still viewed widely as a future mayor or a future statewide elected official. He was someone who could lead, work in a bipartisan fashion, and frankly, 
uh, challenge his constituents to move forward in a progressive way, and yet was still viewed as someone, even if they didn't agree with them, as a future leader in an even higher office beyond that. And that doesn't even get to the fact that he's a Chinese American in a political, uh, in a political world that is virtually entirely Caucasian. Uh, what he had to navigate through all that uh, um, is, it's, it's truly remarkable he was able to accomplish all that. I want to finish asking the uh, answering the question about models. Wing did not have role models. He came here at six years old. There were only a handful of families that had, had children. And when uh, he was older of six and expected to watch after us and take care of us and everything. But one story really illustrates for me the kind of courage and boldness and uh, intelligence that he had. A friend who was in Wing's Chinese uh, class, you know, they go to regular school, then they go to Chinese school afterwards. <laughs> they said that one day Wing stood up and he didn't challenge, but he engaged the instructor in uh, I don't know, debate, conversation, uh, and, and this conversation went on for 15 minutes. And they were astounded because according to, to protocol, you do not question your teacher. <laughs> and for him to stand up and carry on this 15-minute conversation in Chinese, uh, his classmates were just astounded. But I don't know where that came from. But he, he just showed so many examples early, early on, and it just grew. My name is Pat Belarjan, and Wing was a very, very close friend. After he and Ludd were elected, there was a two or three, what, about two months, somebody there knows, uh, before they took office. And it was uh, uh, the autumn, late autumn of 1961, and I was working as several, but a small staff at the Seattle World's Fair, and both Wing and Ludd were assigned to the Seattle World's Fair <laughs> until they took office. So we all got to know him very, very well. And his wit was something that was so dominant and, and so terrific. But I wanted to mention about the open housing campaign. Um, for the last three months of the campaign, I was the executive director of the campaign. And when a lawyer here in Seattle asked me if I'd do it, I said, I'll have to let you know tomorrow. So I called Wing and I said, I want to come over and ask you something. So Wing said that not only did he think I should do it, but he would help me. And Wing was so behind the scenes during that whole uh, three months, uh, three and a half, I guess, and just uh, so generous with his time and his wisdom. I should mention all of you quickly, if it wasn't mentioned in Betty's earlier, I don't remember, the campaign failed abysmally, but uh, later uh, the legislation passed some years later. The other story I wanted to uh, just very briefly mention, because I think it illustrates what Betty was saying, Wing reached out to everybody and uh, I'm really not sure what year, 1963 probably, um, a friend of Wing's, a friend of mine, asked Wing if he would be the main speaker at Chief Seattle Days. Uh, up in Suquamish, they have Chief Seattle Days every August, and they've done it for many, many years. But in 1963, that was not a very affluent or active community. In fact, it was our local third world, I'm afraid. But Wing accepted with alacrity, and he went up, he gave a wonderful talk, also, I have a marvelous picture someplace of Wing sitting there in the middle of a Suquamish in the replica of Chief Seattle's chair with um, the uh, totem pole behind him, uh, Bill, uh, Joe Hilaire's totem pole. And to me, that sort of symbolizes Wing. And as soon as I find the picture, I'm going to give it to the Wing Loot Museum. Thank you.